God's timetable is not always our timetable. And the promises of God for you will be fulfilled in your life, even if you do not see them immediately fulfilled. God's creatures are remarkable. The more I study nature, the more I sense of this incredible design of God. Pacific salmon are an amazing fish. If you haven't studied at all about Pacific salmon, look it up. They're incredible. Pacific salmon spawn, and they swim from the place that they have spawned, often 100 miles, 500 miles, 1,000 miles, and when it gets time for them to die, they come back to the place where they were born. When their life is ebbing away, they want home. And they navigate, many of them, a thousand miles or beyond, back to the place they were born. Now scientists wondered, how do they do this? How does a fish that has left its spawning place and go on a thousand miles, how does it know how to get back home? Well, they've come up with two very plausible reasons. Number one, the fish has a sense of smell. And as the result of that, it can it, imprinted in its brain is the smell of its home. And as it begins to navigate down these rivers, it smells where it's going, and the brain is imprinted of the salmon with that smell, and it can it can navigate its way home. The second thing that they've noticed is this. There was a 2005 study, and researchers discovered, now get this one, researchers discovered that there are single cells in the brain of a salmon that act like compass needles. They have a microscopic collection of magnetic crystals in their brain. And these compass needles in the brain of the salmon lead that salmon back home. Now, salmon have this incredible sense of, of timing. They know when it's about ready to die. They're about ready to die. They know that they're going to spawn, and Pacific span, salmon spawn once in their lifetime. They know it's time to spawn. They're going to die. And so as the result of that, they long for home. When life is ebbing away, they long for home. They have this sense that the fullness of time has come. Imprinted on their brains at birth is this longing for home. And every single one of us have imprinted on our brains by the divine creator a longing for home. We know that there must be something better in life than sickness, in suffering, in heartache, in death. We know deep within the fabric of our beings, that this world is not our home. Now, the purpose that Jesus came to earth was to take us to heaven. The purpose he came to our home in the cosmos is because he wanted to take us to his home in the universe. Now, in one of the most magnificent verses in all the Bible, in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, the Bible describes this Magnificent desire of Christ to take us home. So if you have your Bible, I invite you to take it and turn to Galatians. The fourth chapter, the fourth verse is the basis of our Bible study this morning. Galatians 4 and verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son born of a woman born under the law. Verse 5 to redeem those who were under the law that he might receive the adopt that we might receive the adoptions of sons now there are three things in that passage to notice first there is a divine timetable second there is a definite plan third there is a determined purpose if you look at the text in galatians 4 verse 4 when the fullness of time has come that's a divine timetable god sent forth his son that's a definite plan, to redeem those that were under the law. That's his determined purpose. And I pray as we study these things 
that the Holy Spirit will speak to our hearts, that the Holy Spirit, that same that spoke to the prophets of old, will speak to us. Let's first look at this idea of divine timetable. Now, Jesus didn't come at any time. He came when the fullness of time had come. Now, this should not surprise us because throughout history, God has always orchestrated time. So time is not some simply random event. But we can look at passages in the Old Testament particularly that point out that God has a divine timetable for prophetic events. For example, if you look at Genesis 6 verse 3, the timing of the coming of the flood. It was no random event. Genesis 6 verse 3. The Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man forever, for he's indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. So God had a divine timetable. Noah would preach for 120 years. The flood would come. We find this concept that prophetic events happen on time. Remember, Israel was in captivity to Egyptian bondage. They did not come out of bondage simply at some random timing. If you look at Exodus chapter 12, Exodus chapter 12, throughout history, God has had a prophetic timetable. Exodus chapter 12, verse 41. And it came to pass, Exodus 12, verse 41. And it came to pass at the end of 430 years, on that very same day, it came to pass that all the armies of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Now read verse 51 with me. Do you have it? Exodus chapter 12, verse 51. Maybe it's easier for us to read from the screen. Let's do it together. And it came to pass on that very same day that the Lord brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt according to their armies. So God had predicted that Egypt, that Israel would be in Egyptian captivity for 430 years. And the Bible says in two places, on that very day, God has a prophetic timetable. All the power of Pharaoh could not keep Israel in Egypt. The armies of the Egyptians were no match for the might of the almighty God. And God is always on time. He is never late. We look at the Babylonian captivity. You remember the Babylonian captivity as well. Israel is in captivity to Babylon for 70 years. Nebuchadnezzar is overthrown by, Cyrus, by Darius and Cyrus. But at the end of that 70-year captivity, look at Jeremiah 29, verse 10. God is not a capricious God. God has a divine timetable of prophetic events. Jeremiah, 29th chapter, the 10th verse. All the powers of hell could not keep the rain from falling in Noah's day. All of the Egyptian armies could not keep Israel in captivity after that 430 years. All the might of Babylon could not keep the Babylonians and the Medo-Persians locking the Israelites in captivity. Jeremiah 29, verse 10. For thus says the Lord. Who, who, who says that, everybody? Jeremiah 10. For thus says who? The Lord. After what? Seventy years are completed at Babylon. I will visit you and perform my good work toward you and cause you to return to this place. In other words, after 70 years, all the powers of Babylon, all the powers of Medo-Persia cannot keep you in activity, in captivity, because I'm coming to take you home. Does God have a divine prophetic timetable of events? Indeed, he does. The prophet Daniel predicted the exact time the Messiah would begin his ministry of sacrificial service. And when Jesus came, he came on time. Back to Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. The Bible says in Galatians 4, verse 4, when the fullness of time was come. What time is it? 
It's the fullness of time was come. Now all the powers of Rome, all the powers of the Roman emperors could not keep Jesus from coming to be born. When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son. And it is, isn't it amazing that Augustus Caesar, a pagan Roman ruler, passes this decree that all the world be taxed. And Mary and Joseph leave their home in Nazareth and travel that 90 miles down to Bethlehem for Christ to be born. So as the result of a decree of a pagan Roman ruler, Jesus is born in the right place in Bethlehem that Micah predicted hundreds of years in advance and at the right time, the fullness of time has come. Now there's a remarkable statement, a remarkable statement in Desire of Ages, page 32, that I want you to notice. It says, but like the stars in their vast circuit of their appointed path, God's purpose is no, no haste or delay. What did Galatians 4.4 4 say? In the fullness of time, in the fullness of time, God brought forth his son. God's purpose is no, no haste or delay. Now I want you to think about that. When was the first promise of the Messiah given? When was that? The book of Genesis, right? Genesis 3.15. A serpent had tempted Eve, Satan threw that serpent, and God said the Messiah would come and bruise the head of the serpent, a deadly wound on the serpent, and that uh, Christ's heel would be wounded. So the promise of the Messiah was given in Genesis. Now, every passing generation and century thought that the Messiah might come then. Centuries passed. Each generation longed for the Messiah to come. But the promise tarried. From the days of Adam and Eve, the promise was repeated. Fathers told it to their children. The Messiah is going to come. Mothers sang little song, songs to their little ones on their knee. The Messiah is going to come. Patriarchs and prophets kept the hope alive. But he did not come. Forty long centuries 4,000 years passed, but exactly on time, as Daniel predicted, in the town of Bethlehem, as Micah predicted, born of a virgin, as Isaiah forecast, Jesus was born on time because the purposes of God know no haste or delay. Just as there was a delay in the first advent, there has been a delay in the second advent. But God is always on time. God is never late. And we say, God... Why haven't you come? God, we long for your coming. But the purposes of God know no haste or delay. And God has a divine timetable. Now, there are two striking lessons for an end time people of God. First, because God's promises are not immediately fulfilled does not mean they will not be fulfilled. There are times we become impatient with God. Times we say, God, why haven't you come? And there are times we become impatient with God in our own lives, too. We say, God, I believe in faith, but it didn't happen. We say, God, uh, what's going on here? I've been praying and praying, and I don't see any answers, God. But God's timetable is not always our timetable. And the promises of God for you will be fulfilled in your life, even if you do not see them immediately fulfilled. There's a second lesson, waiting develops patience. Waiting strengthens our faith. Waiting teaches us perseverance. Now there's a danger that in the light of the delay of the advent, we lose the expectation. We lose the anticipation. We lose the excitement. Did the Jews face that problem during the 4,000 years from the time of Genesis to the time Christ was born. They did. The Jews lost that sense of wonder. They lost that sense of excitement. They thought Christ would come the first time 
as a conquering king. They failed to understand the messianic promises that he would come to redeem the human race. When the fullness of time was come, what do you, you think Paul meant by the fullness of time, that the fullness of time had come? There were at least five characteristics that had taken place in the New Testament to create that fullness of time. First, we read about the Pax Romana, that is the Roman peace. So there was peace throughout the Roman Empire during the time of Christ's birth particularly. And during this time of peace, travel was very easily. So this time of peace was a good time for the Messiah to come because the gospel could be spread very quickly at a time of peace where it couldn't be spread at a time of war. Secondly, the Roman Empire had linked the empire together with the Roman roads. So there was to travel was much, more, uh, was much easier, it was much, much quicker. Thirdly, the Romans had spoken the language of Greek, and the Greek language was throughout the empire. So God had a, had a providential design. When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son. You have this time of Roman roads, rapid transportation. You have the time of the quickness of the spread of the gospel. You have one common language, and that common language is the Greek language. There's a couple other things that were going on during this particular period of time as well. Uh, the, you have the heathen religions that are failing. And the heathen religions are desperately failing the people. And as the result of that, there's an openness, there's a receptivity that hadn't taken place before. You also have the fact that the Jews at this time were coming from throughout the empire. And the Jews were gathering at Jerusalem. And so if Christ comes and he's born, since you have the Roman roads that unite the empire, since you have the Greek language that can rapidly spread the gospel, since you have people from every land gathering, the message of the Messiah is going to go forth. Also, if you have moral decadence, also if you have moral decay, also if there's a longing, Ellen White puts it beautifully in the book Desire of Ages and kind of summarizes these reasons on page 32. Let's take a look at it uh, on page 32. When the fullness of time was come, Desire of Ages 32, God sent forth his son. Now what were the conditions? Providence had directed the movements of nations, the tide of human impulse and influence until the world was ripe for the coming of the deliverer. The nations were united under one government. We continue. One language was widely spoken, was everywhere recognized as the language of literature. From all the lands, the Jews of the dispersion gathered to Jerusalem to the annual feasts. And as they returned to the places of their sojourn, they could spread throughout the world the tidings of the Messiah's coming. At this time, the systems of heathenism were losing their hold upon the people. Men were, worth it, were weary of pageant and, pageant and fa fable. They longed for a religion that could satisfy the heart while the light of truth seemed to have departed from among men. There were souls who were looking for light and who were filled with perplexity and sorrow. They were thirsting for a knowledge of the living God, for some assurance of life beyond the grave. As you look at that statement, think of where we are in the world today. Time has passed between the first coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus. But again today, we have the super information highway where the gospel can be spread quickly by internet, by social media, by printed page, by radio, by television around the world. Think about it today. God has designed today that language is no longer a barrier. I can stand here and through variant translation techniques, this message can go to more than 100 countries at the same time. Think of it today. Men and women's hearts are longing for something better. They recognize that this world is on the verge of a stupendous crisis. Think about it today. Nations are weary. Think about it. Pandemic spreading all over the world. Think about it. North Korea, China, Iraq, the potential of nuclear weapons. We've never had weapons that have not been used, that have been created before. For the first time in history, we can blot life off planet Earth. Think about it. Global warming and the concern of science about the future of our planet. Think about it. 
earthquake, famine, fire, flood. Think about it. School shootings where kids go to school that should be safe and they're gunned down. When the fullness of time has come, God brought forth his son. Jesus came the first time when the fullness of time has come. Am I stretching it at all to say that we're living at another time of earth's history when the fullness of time has come? God had a definite timetable. God also had a definite plan. Take your Bible and turn to Galatians 4, verse 4. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. God's purposes know no haste or what, everybody? Delay. God has a prophetic timetable. Did God have a prophetic timetable down through history? Did he bring out of the historical point, did God bring Egypt, make them powerless and bring Israel out of Egypt, bondage, 430 years? Did he bring them out of Babylonian captivity? 70 years. Did Jesus come on time? He came on time. God's promises know no haste or delay. God had a divine timetable, but God had a better, a definite plan. Look at Galatians 4, verse 4. Here's his plan. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under law. So he has a definite time. The fullness of time has come. But he also has... A, 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 he has a divine timetable, but he also has a definite plan. God sent forth his son. Now, the coming of Christ to this world was not some afterthought. It was not something that simply took place because of some rushed decision by some emergency council in heaven when Christ came the first time. It wasn't that, oh, Adam and Eve have sinned, and so the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are just so confused they don't know what to do, and they have to develop this kind of a plan. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit consulted before the creation of human beings and made provision for the potentiality of sin. Again, in the book Desire of Ages, page 22, I read, the plan for our redemption was not an afterthought, a plan formulated after the fall of Adam. It was a revelation of the mystery which had been kept in silence through times eternal. It was an unfolding of the principles that from eternal ages have been the foundation of God's throne. So in his all-seeing wisdom, in his omniscience, God foresaw the existence of sin before it happened. And he planned for Jesus to come and redeem the human race. God was not caught off guard with the rebellion of our first parents. Free will has inherent risks. But God was not only prepared to take the risk, but he had a plan to atone for the damage from the sinful choices. God had a divine plan to redeem this world. For the child of God, don't miss this, life is not some cosmic accident. We're not left alone. God has a divine plan for our lives. Now, when our first parents sinned, God announced the plan that Jesus was going to come before the angels. And we have in the Bible what Jesus responded to the Father when the plan of salvation was announced in heaven. Now, this, this is remarkable. Take your Bible and turn to Hebrews chapter 10. These are the words of Christ to the Father before Jesus is coming to earth. Hebrews chapter 10. And you're going to look there at Hebrews chapter 10. So Christ speaks to the Father before he is incarnated and in Hebrews 10, as the Father and the Son are ready to announce the fact before the angels that Christ is coming to earth, Jesus speaks, and this is what he says in verse 5. Therefore, when he came unto the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire. So all those centuries from the days of Adam to the days of Christ's coming, they were sacrificing sacrificing bulls and goats and lambs. But a body you've prepared for me. So Jesus there in heaven says to the Father, a body you've prepared for me. 
here the divine son of God, the commander of all the angels, the one who existed from the Father, with the Father from all eternity, the one who had never had a beginning and will never have an ending. The eternal Christ will come and dwell in a human body. He'll face the challenges of living in a fallen world. He'll be subject to the fiercest temptations of Satan. Now, the angels don't fully comprehend what's going on. The angels are not, not they don't know. They can't bear to see their beloved leader face the heartache, sorrow, and suffering of the world. And in my imagination, it's not so much imagination because you read it in the divine holy writ. A dazzling angel steps forth. He says, no, Jesus, you cannot go. Jesus, you cannot go. Jesus, you're the divine commander of heaven. Jesus, you're the eternal son of God. Jesus, you're the one that never had a beginning, never had an ending. Jesus, you cannot go. I will go, the angel says. Let me go, Jesus, in your place. You can't go to that defiled world. You can't go to that sin-stricken world. You can't go to that disease-filled world. You can't go to that polluted world. Jesus, let me go. But only the creator can redeem his creation. So mystery of all mysteries, wonder of all wonders, Jesus is born of human flesh. And he dwells among us. And Emmanuel has come. Isaiah 7, verse 14. Isaiah 7, verse 14. Emmanuel has come. Emmanuel has come. Jesus leaves heaven. The Father had a divine timetable. The Father had a definite plan. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. The divine son of God is conceived in the womb of Mary by the Holy Spirit. And this virgin bears a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. God in Christ is tabernacled in human flesh. God in Christ is not far away. God in Christ is with us. He knows our joys. He knows our sorrows. He knows our happiness. He knows our disappointment. He knows our triumphs and defeats. He knows our highs and lows. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 puts it so well. Isaiah 9 verse 6. Notice it here. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government there'll be no end. Notice, unto us is a child born. Who, who is he born to? Who is Jesus given to? Unto what? Us. He is your Savior. He is my Savior. Unto What's that next word? Unto us a son is given. Heaven gave its best gift. The government shall be upon his shoulders. What's all that about? Although he's the son of God, he's also the sovereign ruler of the universe. This world and its affairs are on his, in his hands. He is in charge. Although evil men make sinful choices and wreak havoc, although at times all nature is out of control, although nations battle and pandemics raise, he is still sovereign. He'll accomplish his plan for this world. Having confidence in this sovereign God makes all the difference in your life. He's guiding the destinies of the world, and if you let him, he's guiding the destinies of your life. That brings enormous peace to our hearts. It's a great stress reliever to know that the government is upon his shoulders. What's that mean? He is the ruler yet. He is the divine sovereign yet. He is the one that sits on the throne of the universe yet. And he's the big God who guides the planets, guides the stars, and he can guide every single one of our lives. Notice, for unto us a what? Child is born, he's born unto us. Unto us a son is given, the government is upon his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful. What does that word wonderful mean? He's full of wonders. He's full of wonders. He's going to surprise you. He's full of wonders. This son that is tabernacled in human flesh for you. This Christ that wants you to have the best in life. He is full of wonders for you. His name shall be called counselor. You know, a lot of times people come to me and say, Pastor Mark, can you give me a little counsel here or there? 
sometimes I'm wondering about if I'm wise enough to do that, you know. It's, one, it's a blessing to get counsel from other people, but I'll tell you one thing. It's a blessing to get counsel from Jesus. Jesus is a wonderful, what everybody? Counselor. I've had so many times in my life where I've been in dilemmas. I mean, more dilemmas than you would know. And the wonderful counselor has given me guidance. And I think of some of those specific experiences. On one occasion, I was having evangelistic meetings in Sweden. And uh, in Stockholm. Preaching in a large auditorium in Stockholm. And I was working as the ministerial secretary of the Trans-European Division at the time. And we had 19 countries, and I was responsible for pastors in those countries, so we had to fly a lot. And the president of that division's name was Jan Paulson, who later became president of the General Conference. And he said to me, look, Mark, we're having a meeting in Croatia. That is in former Yugoslavia. And he said, you really need to be there on Tuesday. He said, whatever you do, I have to have you there on Tuesday because Elder Neil Wilson, who is the, pres who is the General Conference president, the father of the current president, he said, you've really got to be there. He's going to be there, and you have to give a report on the ministerial work in our division, so don't miss the meeting. He said, preach on your Sunday night, and then, um, then come. I said, sure. So I figured out how I could get there, and it was going to be tough because, of course, at that time, Yugoslavia was communist, and Croatia and Serbia both were very communistic. And I figured, okay, this is the only thing I can do. After I preach on Sunday night, the meeting will get over at 9 o'clock. There's a train that goes from Stockholm to Copenhagen. I can take that train. I'll take an all-night train, try to sleep on the train. So I got down to the train station about 10.30 and get on the train. It was a horrible, horrible night. The, 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 the tr I couldn't sleep at all. I didn't sleep most of the night. And the train took me to Copenhagen in Denmark. So I came to Denmark, and uh, I was half-tired got to the Copenhagen airport, and I was going to fly to Vienna and take a flight from Vienna to Zagreb, which is the capital of Croatia. So I get to Vienna. I'm half tired, knowing that I have to be in this meeting. It's now Monday afternoon, and I, I'm running through the airport because I had a tight connection. I look up at the board, and it says, fog, airport in Zagreb, fogged in, flight canceled. And I am there in the Vienna airport on a Monday afternoon, knowing I have to be at my meeting early Tuesday. And I'm thinking, oh no, there's no way. I mean, it's impossible. And I just went by a little corner and I prayed, now Lord, I need your wisdom. I need you, the almighty counselor. You need to help me, Lord, because I, I gotta be at that meeting. I don't know what to do. I can't get there flying. And all of a sudden, I got this impression, go into the bookstore. I said, bookstore? Where am I going to go read a book? My wife knows I love books, but this was not the time or the place. Go into a bookstore. So I went into the bookstore, and the first thing I saw was a book of maps. So I picked up the map book, and I figured something out. This is what I figured out. That Austria, and I knew this ahead of time, that Austria borders Yugoslavia. It borders creation, Croatia. And I, I remembered in my mind that our school at Marishevitz was about 50 miles from the border. And I said, I know what I'm going to do. If I can catch a flight to this particular town that I see on the map, I'm going to walk across that border under communism. I'm going across. I'm going to get at that meeting. <laughs> so I ran back out. I saw on the board 30 minutes of flights leaving. And I'm saying, Lord, you're my wonderful counselor on this one. <laughs> You've got to get me there, Lord. You're my wonderful counselor. So. I bought a ticket, flew to this place, and I said to the cab driver, take me to the border. He said, I, I can't take you all the way, but I'll take you part where you've got to walk the rest. Well, I had been in Yugoslavia many times, and I knew a little bit about the political and the sociological and the religious dynamics. And I, I didn't have a visa, incidentally, but I knew that there would be a guard station at the border. I also knew that in Serbia, at the airport, they could stamp my visa, so I was counting on it that at, um, they could give me a visa, and I was counting that Croatia and Zagreb, they could give me a visa. I got to the border, walking. A young communist guard is standing there and other soldiers, and I said, uh, I, I, I need to go over there. He kind of looked, he says, passport. I gave him my passport. No visa, no visa, no goal, no visa. I said, Lord, you're my wonderful counselor. <laughs> what did you get me into here? Now, I had called my office in England. I said, look, I'm walking across that border. 
And when I get across, I called them from the airport. I said, when I get across, I need a car there to take me immediately to that meeting. And so I said to the guard, passport, no visa, no visa. Now, I knew in those days that Yugoslavia was, was in five republics, and I knew that Serbia was Orthodox, and Croatia was Catholic, and they had this big head. And I just kept praying, Lord, you've got to get me through this. You, you, you impressed me to look at that map. You've got to get me through this. You're my counselor. I have nobody to talk to. And the Lord impressed me with something. I opened my passport, and I said, Serbia visa at the airport. Serbia, very, very good. Croatia, no visa here. Croatia as good as Serbia. He stamped my passport. He said, you go. <laughs> so I went. God is a wonderful counselor. You are going to find yourself at times, like I did in that experience, with no human counsel that can solve your problem. But what does our text say? He is a what? Let's look at our text again. It's Isaiah 9, verse 6. For unto us, Christ, a child is born. Unto us, a son is given. Jesus is given to you. Absorb everything that he is to you. Unto us, a child is born. Unto us, a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called, what? Wonderful. He will do wonders for you. Counselor, he's your, he's your counselor. And here's the good news. The one who is wonderful, the one who is your counselor, is the one of the next two words. What is he? He is the mighty God. We have a counselor who's the mighty God. We have a counselor. He's the mighty God. He's the everlasting father. He's the prince of peace of the increase of his government. There will be no end. Jesus is a wonderful counselor. He's the mighty God who gives power to his children to carry out his counsel. He has the characteristics of the everlasting father, the prince of peace, and he'll bring peace to our hearts. He has a divine timetable. He's always on time. He has a determined plan. He sent his son, a definite plan. He sent his son into the world. But he has a, diver a determined purpose. A divine timetable, a definite plan, a determined purpose. Back to Galatians 4, verse 4. Back to Galatians 4, verse 4. God is never late. He's always on time. He has a definite plan. He sent his son into the world. God will not be late with his second coming, and God has a definite plan. But he has a determined purpose. We find it in Galatians 4, verse 4. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Now, what is, his, what is God's determined purpose? Verse 5, to redeem those who were under the law that he might receive the adoption as sons. God's determined purpose in coming to this world was to redeem us. The longing of his heart is that we will be with him forever. The ransom price has been paid. His sacrifice is complete. We are his children adopted into the family of God through the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. There is nothing more important to God than getting us home. There's nothing more important to God than getting us home. His advent has been delayed, but he's never late. He invites us to be faithful while we wait. Although the promise tarries, just as the first coming of Christ was on time, his second coming will be on time. He's always on time. His promises never fail. In Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 3, we read about the promises of God. This promise in the book of Habakkuk relates to the second coming of Christ. Habakkuk chapter 2, you're looking there at verse 3. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, the vision of his coming, the vision of his return. At the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it. Because it shall surely come, it will not tarry. That's the New King James Version. Listen to the contemporary English version of this one. Here's the contemporary English version of Habakkuk 2 verse 3. At the time I have decided... 
my words will come true. You can trust what I say about the future. It may take a long time, but keep on waiting. It'll happen. The fullness of time has come. Strife in our cities, rising crime and violence, natural disasters, the threat of nuclear conflagration, a sagging economy, moral decay, and a host of other social and economic and political problems indicate the fullness of time has come. Environmental problems, ecological problems, our planet rapidly deteriorating indicate the fullness of time has come. Global pandemics that have confounded even the wisest scientific minds indicate the fullness of time has come. The global uncertainty of our times indicates the fullness of time has come. The rapid spread of the gospel, as we mentioned, through internet, social media, television, radio, printed page, missionaries going around the world indicate the fullness of time has come. The Christ who came once as a babe in Bethlehem's manger has a determined purpose. The reason he came once was so he could come twice. The reason he came the first time was so he could come the second time. The reason he came to die on a cross was so he could come and reign as a king. The reason he came to bring salvation to your heart is not to leave you in a world of sin, suffering, heartache, and death, but it's to bring you home. He came once to redeem you, the humanity. Now he's coming to, to claim his purchased possession. He came once to our earthly planet. Now he's coming to take us to his heavenly home. The entire purpose of the plan of salvation is to get us home. This world with its sickness, suffering, and death is not our home. The victory has been won. Satan is a defeated foe, and he knows it. So he's fighting with all of his might to take everybody down in destruction with him. Why is it that the devil is warring on our young people? Why is it that all this smut and trash is over the internet to capture our minds and deceive our souls? Why is it that he's influencing Hollywood with its lust it's robbery, it's murder, it's bloodshed. Why is it that many are captivated in this society with materialism and secularism? Why has the devil unleashed all the powers of hell on this generation? Because he knows that the fullness of time has come. Satan can study prophecy. He knows that we're on the verge of the kingdom of God. Jesus has one plan, and that's to take us home. Christ has conquered. Eternal life is ours. Heaven is on the horizon. And soon, we are going home. In December of 1945, the Second World War was over. Peace treaties had been signed. The victory had been won. But there were still 8 million sailors, Marines, Army, service people still that hadn't been home. And the United States government had been planning for the end of the war for many, many months. And they planned what they called Operation Magic Carpet. We have to get home, our boys. We've got to bring them home, eight million of them. And so 370 vessels, everything that floated, Everything that could carry our soldiers home began evacuating them from the shores of England, began evacuating them from the Philippines and Japan, the Atlantic and the Pacific, this great evacuation take place. The aircraft carrier Saratoga repatriated 29,204 soldiers. We were bringing back 435,000 military people a month. The Queen Elizabeth and the Queen Mary had been painted gray at the beginning of the war, and they were going across the Atlantic to bring back our soldiers. Now, when these soldiers came home, the trains were jammed, but there was a motto, home alive in 45, home alive in 45, we gotta get our soldiers home. The whole effort of the American government was bring those soldiers back from the Second World War, home alive in 45. And the song was, we'll be home before Christmas. We'll be home before Christmas. And so many of them were brought home December to Los Angeles, but they live in Chicago. They, they lived in New York City. 
How are they going to get home? They were going on the trains. Citizens who bought tickets on the train said, soldier, take my place. Soldier, take my place. Very often, those trains would not be able to get them home before Christmas. It would be Christmas Day, and there'd be someplace in you know, the Midwest, Iowa, not home to Chicago, not home to, to New York, not home to Boston. And the trains would be there. People would come down to the train and say, soldier, they never met these guys before. Come home with me. They'd bring them home for Christmas dinner. They would give them gifts. There were taxi drivers in Los Angeles that said to soldiers, look, soldier, you need a ride? I do. Where do you live? Chicago. Get in. And taxi drivers took these soldiers home because they were war-torn. They had come from the battle. And they took them, didn't charge them a thing except for the gas. One taxi driver took his people from Los Angeles to New York City. Six soldiers. I got to get them home. I, all of America. We've got to get them home. But yet there were one group that they hadn't got home in 1945. These were war brides. 70,000 war brides. American soldiers had married some of the English girls that looked quite nice to them. And had, they had married French. In 1946, the war brides began coming. And when these war brides began coming, came into the New York Harbor, there were bands that were playing. Can you just imagine these soldiers now getting their brides home? The greatest evacuation in history took place in the Second World War. Eight million brought home. They were brought home to joy, brought home to gladness, brought home to cheering, weary, war-torn soldiers. But that's not going to be the greatest evacuation of history. Jesus is not coming with 370 ships. He's coming with 10,000 times 10,000 angels. The greatest evacuation in history is yet to take place. Jesus is coming. All of heaven is excited. All of heaven is thrilled. Jesus is coming with his angels to take us home. And the golden gates of the gleaming city of God will be thrown open. And Jesus will lead us before the angelic hosts. And he will say, these are my people. Welcome home. And the great banquet feast will take place. The marriage supper of the Lamb on that long table beyond what our eye can see. It will outshine any Christmas celebration. Jesus is coming. We will travel with him from planet to planet, from star to star. He's coming to take us home. The heavenly bridegroom is more excited than those bridegrooms that had married during the war, those brides in a foreign land. Jesus sees us weary, war-torn. The battle has been long. Some of the soldiers of Christ have been wounded. Some of them have died in battle. It's been a bloody conflict. It's been a long conflict. But he's coming to take us home. And deep within our hearts, we long for home. Imprinted in our brains is the longing for home. His coming has been delayed. But the promise is sure. When the fullness of time has come, God again will send forth his, his, his son to take his children home. Amen. And deep within my heart, I want to be ready, don't you? Amen. I don't want to miss the great, great homecoming. I want nothing in my life to be between me and the Savior. Think of what it's going to be that day when we stream with him in dazzling glory through the cars of the sky back from this war-torn, weary world to be welcomed to the greatest celebration of the ages, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Do you want to go? You want to just raise your hand and say, Lord, I want to go. Oh, my Father, you're coming soon. Time is going on longer than we've expected.
but you're coming. And we long for that day when you will come to take us home. Thank you, Jesus, that our hearts can anticipate that, that we can live in the excitement of the Advent today, tomorrow, and until you come. In Christ's name, amen.